one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. If you would, please close your eyes. What was the color of the fish that's on my hat? How about the accent color of my shoelaces? What's up on the screen? Now if you open your eyes, I'm in a different place. Now imagine <coughs> someone coming to your website, whether you're a developer, a designer, a writer, and things move around. You know, we tend to hide menus, have things push around on sliders, but for someone that can't see or has a disability, do we really care? Here's some statistics. And we always hear them. One in five Americans has a disability. 43 million total. One in 18. 315 million. 4.3% of the nation's population, the world's population has a disability. Today we're gonna to talk about accessibility from a designer standpoint. Why do we neglect 20% of our audience? Do you think our clients want one fifth less money? Is it our egos? We're all experts after all. If you look around, there's been some incredibly talented people speaking today. So we, we're paid to know the answers. But why do we neglect a certain audience? The, the, at the beginning of this presentation, I've seen statistics that in the first 30 seconds that someone's on your website, they make a decision whether they're gonna leave or click through. So imagine how uncomfortable you felt when I asked you to close your eyes and describe things that I gave you five seconds to, to see. Imagine someone that can't see permanently or has, doesn't have the use of their limbs. We have to consider those people. So today, in the next 50 minutes that we have together, I'm gonna try to change your mindset a little bit. I'm gonna have you, I want, at, by the end of this session, I want you to be an advocate. I want you to be that person in the room that fights for accessibility. I'm a statistic after all. About a year ago, I had two blocked arteries. I had a heart event. When I wheeled out of the hospital in a wheelchair and I went home, the first three days, I was bedridden. After they opened my arteries, it was like a, I was dragged down the street by a herd of elephants. I had no energy. I bled easily, I bruised easily, and if I got up too fast, I would pass out. So the first few days when I was in bed, I said, hmm, let me do an experiment. I said, I picked up my laptop. I said, let me order groceries. I went, oh, by the way, my slides are gonna be here. You can find me anywhere, Joe Simpson Jr. at Gmail, at Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna make the slide deck available afterwards as well. So I decided to order groceries. After all, they all say, we can deliver it to your home. I pulled up the website. I hit the tab key. Nothing happened. That's one quick thing that you can always do to immediately find out if a site is addressing accessibility issues. Each website, you're supposed to be able to access it with the keyboard. So they immediately failed. I love pho. I said, hey, let me try to order some food from my favorite Vietnamese restaurant. A couple of years earlier, I tore the ligaments in my wrist. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not always this sickly. <laughs> I, I tore the ligaments in my wrist and I couldn't use my hand. That restaurant only had PDF menus. So if I needed to pinch and zoom, I couldn't. That was inaccessible. I was also driving around this time. Eventually I got back into the flow of things. I took a, a brief leave of absence. But during that time when I was off, I kept doing these little experiments. How many of us use Google Maps or in CarPlay or something like that to get around? We use a combination of our senses to do a lot of what we achieve. When we're driving around with Google Maps, we listen to some of the calls, but we also look at the map because detours come up. You can't really do it without looking at it. So I would cover it up and see. 
the point is, we use a combination of our senses to access our websites. I always like to, to use quotes in my, my presentations. This quote really stands out because it should apply to all of us. Oh, it shouldn't apply to all of us, but we often do this. There are no constraints on the human mind, no walls around the human spirit, no barriers to our progress except those that we ourselves erect. A lot of times we're our worst enemy. I ride a Metrolink train in every day, about 50 minutes in from Santa Clarita, and there's a woman that I sit with each day and she boastfully told me this. She said, I always use a carpool lane as a, as a single driver. I figure the ticket that I'm gonna get, I'm gonna pay for it in the time saved blowing through traffic. So we as designers, why would we design inaccessible websites and put ourselves and our clients at risk for legal action? In, in 2017, you may have read that Winn-Dixie, a large chain, was sued and they lost a court case based on uh, the Americans with Disability Act. So you might say, hey, my clients aren't as big as Winn-Dixie, why do I need to pay attention to that? Here are some lawsuits that are either currently going on or been settled uh, regarding accessibility and their companies. Every type of business, Netflix, Hulu, Nike, Target, Domino's, B of A, U.S. Department of Education. If you think it can't touch you, it may, and this is sort of my scared straight section of the, of the presentation. <laughs> this may not even work, but just think, if large companies are being sued for their accessibility, couldn't it touch you? To give you a little background on the rules and guidelines, I'm just gonna give you a brief history. Uh, the WCAG 2.1, which you may know about, um, these guidelines specify how you can make your content accessible, uh, especially for people with disabilities, but also using all user agents. Um, it's not limited to devices, every type of device, including mobile phones. The history of the guidelines, it, it was first created in 1999, updated in 2008, and as recently as last summer, it was updated to 2.1. For me, I work for a government agency, and if you receive federal funds for your company, you have to also make sure that your site complies with Section 508. In January of this year, they updated their rules to, to be more in line with WCAG 2.1. So both of them are similarly as difficult, well, I shouldn't say as difficult, they are stringent in terms of standards that you need to meet to make sure that your site is accessible. I also have what I call unquotes in this presentation. These are act actual things that people said to me during a project that I was working on. With. I was working with a designer I originally took it, usually when I start on a project, I take a look at their comps, their color, color studies, and I immediately go check them to make sure that the color contrast is good. When I said, hey, your colors don't really work in terms of accessibility, we're a government agency, yada, yada, yada. She said, we really like our brand colors that we use. They're much more lively than the darker ones that you suggest. We're gonna talk a little bit about color. You may not be football fans, but a couple of years ago, 2015, this happened. Can anyone sort of imagine where I'm gonna go with this? I can imagine the marketing office in New York for NFO office, there was a young person, I shouldn't say a young person, I'm gonna say a goober, that said, hey, I have a great idea. Why don't we make the NFL team's uniforms all one solid color? very vivid, very lively, hasn't been done before, we'll sell a million jerseys. And they went around the room and each person was like, yes, let's do it tomorrow. And this happened. What I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna pull up a simulator that simulates colorblindness to show you what someone with colorblindness may have seen that night. And just imagine, this is a still image. What they saw on Thursday Night Football 
or tiny images running across the screen. Okay, and this is a simulator. So all the colors look very similar. This turned into a viral firestorm for the NFL. They got a lot of criticism, and I think last week they announced that they were gonna end color rush uniforms. Why would someone make a decision like that? One in 12 men are colorblind. I think one in 200 women are. So they immediately excluded those people with the hopes of selling uniforms. Here are some rules when, you, when you're thinking about color. And again, this presentation is really more content focused. A lot of us, in addition to building websites, we produce a lot of content that goes up or we have people that do that for us. And again, by adding this to your toolkit, you can add value to what you offer your customers, which your customers can then turn around and sell to their uh, potential buyers. Color shouldn't be the only way that you use to convey information on your website. It's important that your foreground and background color combinations provide sufficient contra color contrast. And that's probably the biggest thing that you can fix and control and impact accessibility. Here's our first example. And during this session, I'm gonna put a few things up and I'd like for you to give me your input on it. Looking at this screen, and, and while I was doing the research for this presentation, I said, hey, let's look up live, lively color websites. There was actually uh, inspiration, a web design inspiration site called All Wards. And I started flicking through the pages and I saw this. And I guess the team at that website decided this Website was awesome. So when you look at this in terms of colors, how many people, just a show of hands, think that this is accessible, this color combination? All right, we're gonna jump out and take a look. And during the course of the presentation, I'm also gonna share some tools with you that you can quickly find. Um, I went through and popped in, uh, this is contrastratio.com. Uh, you can put in the foreground and background colors and it tells you if it meets the ratio needed. So as you can see, it's warm, which means it's close, but it fails. And you can also switch colors. So this is a great way. I would say use this bookmark and you can quickly check the color palettes of your customers. So obviously, although it was a winner, it was a loser. Right here again are some uh, color test, color contrast testing tools. Um, there's also a, a, color, a color contrast analyzer for Google Chrome. That one's a little buggier. I tested this very page uh, with that tool, and it and it passed. So anyway, be a little cautious using that one, but the top two are great for that. Here's another comment or unquote. We have a very limited audience in mind for this website and our de design containers caters to that specific group. They said that uh, when I said, hey, you know, you really should design for mobile backwards. They wanted to only design a desktop website. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about content. That image, by the way, I'll just jump back, relates to structure and patterns. When you're working to, to make your site accessible, you're creating patterns that a screen reader or a user of a screen reader gets familiar with as they work through your website. We're gonna focus on headings, tables, things of that nature in this demo here. Sit semantic. HTML is the structure of your web pages and creating it in a way that a screen reader can easily access and work its way through. This is the wordpress.org site. And as you can see, um, we have a menu, buttons, headings. Here, you work your way down. And now let's just take a look at a, a sample of what the screen reader might see. So 
you're a, you're a person that can't see. It's going to go through your page, a good site. When you hit the tab, it allows you to skip the menu because again, a menu, if you have a, a really, like some menus are very complicated. And can you imagine a screen reader having to go through a menu on every single page it gets to? Another rule that you should always incorporate is making sure you have a skip uh, navigation uh, part of portion in your code. Um, it's going to look at the, for H1s. You should only have one H1 per page. And then it'll work through the H2s on the page. What this does is mimic what we, as folks with multiple senses, um, we tend to, we, we get an article in, the, in our email, for example. Someone recommended it to us. We'll briefly look at the, the subject line. We'll say, hey, we'll pull it up. If, that in, if the subject interests us, we'll pull it up. We'll give it a quick scan. We'll say, hey, maybe that image looks good. Oh, that headline looks good. And then we decide whether we're gonna go forward or not. Someone with disabilities does basically the same thing. The screen reader allows them to pull out the main headings, take a quick look, and decide whether you're gonna go forward with it or not. Um, these are some tags that are important in terms of semantic HTML. Certain uh, tags provide descriptions and definitions. Um, header, nav, main, aside, and footer talks about the page's structure. Um, uh, tags like H1 down through H6, they provide additional meaning, or, or they also provide a level of importance or priority for the person that's taking a look at that. Then there's also tags that cause interaction. I've also seen uh, coders that drop a lot of spans in or a lot of divs, a lot of page builders drop millions of divs in to your HTML. That's not really a good practice because the screen reader doesn't really provide any information. Um, in terms of your content, I would say make sure that you write succinctly. Earlier in the day, uh, a gentleman talked about um, using Grammarly. Grammarly is great. Also use Yoast. Someone talked about that earlier in the, in the 39 uh, things that you should do with your uh, WordPress site. Those things teach you to write a, a, a compliant slug. All these things also help your page rank better. So why wouldn't you do that? We all want our pages to rank higher in SEO. And also by doing that, we make it more accessible. Only, and I mentioned a couple of seconds ago, one H1 per page. And uh, also I've, I've seen in the past, uh, for example, we had a, a CSS person that designed two tags that were basically the same. The only thing that was different was the line spacing below it or the paragraph spacing below. And so a lot of people on our team used an H3 instead of the H2. You don't want to go out of order really when you're structuring your content. Just work through and be consistent with what you do. Here's a, a screenshot of the Yoast uh, plugin. The great thing about it, it, it creates uh, an SEO friendly title. It also goes through and either it gives you red, yellow, or green based on how close to making your, your site really SEO friendly. It also talks about readability. If you write to the, a perfect audience, um, you, you would, again, um, you would improve your page rank. Um, a lot of folks tend to write on and on and on. We're all great writers. We want people to know how creative we are, but we need to write more succinctly for people that want to skim and scan your content. Here's an example of uh, good SEO page titles. Again, you want to go from specific to general. Uh, some, most themes that, it, that meet the accessibility guidelines audit um, put the specific information on the left and your website name on the right. So make sure you look for that. So in this case, um, the page title is Bass Fishing Se Secrets and the website title is Castaic Tech and, Ty and, Tech and Tackle. Again, you work in the same manner for all your pages. And again, this helps you rank better because that's the first thing that your uh, screen reader sees. In terms of your hyperlinks, this is a thing that drives me wild because this is a constant fight at our job. Our marketing folks, they go out and write things. Or for example, in the WordPress environment, uh, if you're using um, a blog, and you have an excerpt, you get to read more. You need to avoid that. You need to avoid click here, download, continue reading. These things are absolutely meaningless 
for a screen reader user. You need to use meaningful link text. And a little later on in this presentation, I'm going to show you a plugin that will go in, it will grab your page title and substitute it for the read more because you want your hyperlinks to have meaning. So someone with a screen reader will understand what they're going to get when they click on that link. What do you see when you see this page? And again, because it's on screen, you might not get everything, but there's a couple of phrases, abstract impressionism and blind spotting that are in a cool, cool gray, a 666. Those are links. So someone with the screen reader will see an entire page of black text and have no idea where the links are. What's a simple solution for that? Exactly. For some reason, that's a stake in a vampire's heart for a designer to underline text. Please, that's so simple. Just do it. You can also make the links bold for even more of an impact. So again, when someone can't see color and they look at the page, they'll see a difference between the abstract and precision text and the can rest you, of the text. Can you also have a description tag? You can. I mean, that's overkill, but right. you can no, do that. That's what I had to do. I did an ADA site and we had to put in yeah. every link had to have a description and a word, word, word. Yeah, and what you can do also, I'm going to have a couple of testing tools. You can run a test. I mean, sometimes it's over, and we're going to have a, another exercise in a second that's going to put you to the test or something like that. Because sometimes you don't want to overkill because, again, put yourself in their situation. How often do you want to read all that extra stuff when you're looking for something specific? You're on to the next website. Now we're going to talk a little bit about media. Here's our next example. One of my favorite authors, um, Imagine the first paragraph underneath the photo, and then we're gonna take a look. It's a multiple choice quiz. Which of the following four would be the proper alt tag for that image? This image is not a link, it's just a, a basic photo. Would it be A, image of Zora Neale Hurston, B, Zora Neale Hurston, was reintroduced by Alex Walker, an empty alt tag image will suffice, or just her name? Okay. If someone said, hey, tell me why. Okay. Did, did anyone say B? Why B? Okay. Anyone said C? Okay. And D? Okay. If you selected D, you're correct. For A, too much information. Someone with the screen reader already knows by the tag that, that an image is there. <laughs> Again? Child with balloons. Okay. And with each image, you want to decide whether the image is functional or just decorative. And that will sort of dictate what you put in there. <laughs> but again, just by reading the text, you have no idea. There's no connection between the two. You want the context of what the um, caption is in relation to the photo. And with, D, with C, we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, D is the, the correct answer because it's just a photo of her. Yes? It depends on what the caption is and for each image and the context of the context of the image, the context of the text around it, excuse me. No, you don't want to repeat all text. Yeah, you want to be specific. All right. Here's the second one. This is the bonus bonus question. This time the image is a link and also beneath her name is a link. So with those two factors in mind, which one is the appropriate answer? Would it be A, an empty alt tag attribute will suffice? B, Wikipedia entry for Zora Neale Hurston? C, read more? That's not the answer. <laughs> or D, Zora Neale Hurston? It's a tongue twister. B, A, 
That's what you're leaning to. <clears throat> Who said that? What? Why, why do you feel that way, Joe? Because, uh, okay, let's say, for instance, you're leaning to the image, within the image link, then you would say uh, image of such and such, versus uh, the text link, you would say Wikipedia entry on the person's name, or vice versa, depending on where it's actually going. Okay. Because with accessibility, they want to know where they'll be taken to if they take the time to go. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> in this case, it's an empty because this the photo is a link and it has a function. The text below has a link and it tells you what the link is. So you don't. Yes, and it's it's it tells you who it is, and it also it prefer, it prefer, tells you what the function of the link is. So again, you don't want to give them too much. And again, this is very basic. These are all on, I think, the WebAIM page. They have a whole bunch of these tests for you to go through. And I would recommend, if you, when you grab the slide deck, just go in and do some of those tests, and you'll be amazed. It'll help you write your captions for your photos, because again, I was in the same mindset. I need to be as thorough as possible. Again, no one knows what they're gonna get on the other end, but again, you're telling them what the function of the link is in relation to the photo. And, and again, we just talked about this. What's the purpose of the visual? Is there a better way to con convey the purpose? Which parts of the visual are decorative, informational, or functional? Now we're gonna look at another type of content, a complex image or infographic. All right. What's the problem with this? A colorblind person would see this. So it's all the same shape, all the same color. This, you're jumping ahead, but that's perfect. You're going to get a hat. <laughs> I don't know if you saw my Twitter feed. You're going to get a hat. All right. So to solve this problem, simply change the shapes for each line. You can also go the extra mile. Again, in our office, we deal with a lot of maps, uh, with a lot of complex information. The shapes will work, but what will be even better, you can add description, a legend. What do each of those points mean with the, with the company in text? All right, now we're gonna sort of move our way towards WordPress. As you can see, Themes are sort of our clothes for our websites. They present what we want to present to our, our customers and our clients. I'm not sure if you know, WordPress offers accessible ready themes. These can be the basis of what you build and it's an optional stage. When you submit a theme for review with wordpress.org, they'll also do this optional series of testing to see if it's accessible. If it is, you'll get the accessible ready tag. This is what they look for, and this is what, what's required. At the top of the presentation, I mentioned that I went to the grocery store site and hit the tab, and nothing happened. Your site has to be accessible for a keyboard user. It has to have the kit, skip link. I'm not gonna go into each of these things, but we've talked about uh, a few of these things already in terms of color contrast. A lot of these things have to be built in in order for it to pass. Now, how do you find those? On .com, if you click on the feature, search by feature, it'll pop down a box that says the very first item is accessible ready. Now, the thing that's bad and what I'm standing here before you today to ask, I think there's over 6,000 themes in the repository. There's only 34 accessible already on .com. But again, these are starting points that you can build your content with or your projects with. On .org, I did the same thing. Um, if you click on the filter box in the center column, there's an accessible ready checkbox and it'll bring back the 
123 things on .org that are accessible already. Here, uh, in terms of plugins, if you need help with that, again, the great thing is that there are a whole bunch of tools out there that you can use to quickly go and do some basic testing to give yourself a sense, uh, a, a bit of peace of mind in relation to accessibility. Probably the most popular is WP Accessibility by Joseph Dolson. Um, he also made um, Contact Form 7 plugin. It's a riff on the actual uh, Contact Form plugin where it's an accessible form. Here's some of the features that you'll find very beneficial. And this is just a few of the many. It, it, it puts in, uh, it requires that you add an alt tag to your images. How many of us just hit the upload button and drop it in and keep on rolling? This plugin will force you to use an alt tag. Um, it'll also, and I mentioned earlier, it'll grab the title of your page, your post title, and drop it in the read more area to solve that problem. It also adds uh, standard form fields where they're missing. It also provides an outline for uh, the focus state. And I didn't really talk about that, and I don't know if I have an example, but if you're hitting the tab, someone with a disability, um, it highlights there's an active state around the buttons. And that's built into the accessibility ready themes as well. You want to show color contrast between the heck, it can also test for that inside of the plugin. So again, I would say if you're not using this, you might want to give it a try. Also, uh, a leader in the WordPress space in terms of accessibility is Rachel Cherry. Uh, she has a plugin also, it's Wally, and she also uh, puts on WP Campus. And she also has a page of accessibility resources. And it's a, a quick click through to get a lot of the resources to help you make your site accessible. If you want to give back, and the reason I'm standing before you today is I got a second chance at life. And I said, hey, I'm going to go out and do the things I wanted to do. I want to do the things that I love. And so I'm standing before you today because I feel passionate about accessibility. Um, but if you want to go that next step and give back, you can always volunteer to help at Make WordPress Accessible. This is a URL. They have a Slack channel. They're always working on uh, things to make the core better. Um, and during the Gutenberg uh, presentation, um, he mentioned that they also have an accessibility team that's contributing there. So it's a place that needs help. Imagine as we transition to Gutenberg, how many themes are going to be updated to be accessible. It's a great opportunity to jump in and help. And again, they have a blog. They give you updates uh, on what's going on. And again, they have a Slack channel. It also has an accessibility handbook. It goes through a lot of the stuff that I talked about today in more detail. But again, if you make small changes, you can make drastic improvements on your website. So today, as I finish, here are some takeaways. You can add value to the services that you provide. And like, I think in the, the value, the price value uh, presentation today, how he showed basic up to premium, you're adding to the values that you can provide your customers. Hey, I'm gonna make sure that your site is, performs better on accessibility. When it's semantic, it'll load faster. You can say, hey, we're gonna make your website load faster. These are things that you can add to your toolkit to raise your value as well. Again, write succinctly and make sure it's SEO friendly. Your pages will rank higher. Design a user experience where the color isn't an issue. Again, a lot of times it's a tussle with designer. It's an ego battle. I'm not there to fight you because you know what you're talking about. There's a law. Let's, let's comply with that. It's sort of like the foundation of your house. Everyone needs a foundation, but what you put on top of that can be very different. The foundation of a good website, in my opinion, is good accessibility. And what I really want to happen today, I want you to be that person in the room, not unlike the person that was at the NFL offices who didn't speak up about color contrast issues and came out with the color rush uniform. With this bit of knowledge that I share with you today, advocate for accessibility when you're in a meeting with your client. 
if you hear something that's going to happen on your project that's not accessible, speak up. And I'll leave you with this. Don't expect to see change if you don't make one. I'm Joe Simpson. You can find our meetup at any of these also. We're just north of the city. These are my slides. Thank you. All right. Oh. All right. <laughs> Sorry. I'll also tweet it out, and it'll also be on the WordCamp. Yes, question. The question was, there's markup that is hidden by CSS. Is that poor markup? No. Is that poor accessibility? Are they ARIA labels or? I mean, I think labels in a form is always good. Yes, yeah, I, that's, that's fine. Because the screen reader is reading the code. It's not looking at your page or the person can't see your page. They're reading through the tags and making their way through your form. So when they get to that first form field and it says name, that's good. When it jumps to the next one, address. So I think you're good. Yes. Yes. Uh, at the at the top of the, the slide deck, um, accessibility works down through all the devices. So if your site is responsive and it works, I mean, if it if it passes test, if, if it passes the test, um, I think there's also some mobility guidelines that are that are probably on the website. I think there's like 66 checkpoints. I would just confirm there, but your site needs to be accessible from a mobile standpoint too. So for for example, if someone has a disability and there comes to your website on a phone and it doesn't work, you're still going to get it. So it needs to be accessible on a mobile, mobile device. Yes? Um, I had a question. I'm all on board about making, you know, improving this, but what, I have a number of clients right now that are being threatened with lawsuits for not being ADA compliant. And what's the measurement? I know that there's a particular tool I use to run through there and it got a percentage back, like 85% compliant. What is the standardized, industry standard tool to use to make it legally ADA? Well, I don't think there's a, 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 a tool that's a standard. There's a, a number of different ways for you to validate it. Well, look at the look at the guidelines. Uh, you can be double A or triple A. Triple A is a lot tougher. That means you meet all 66 standards that are set forth, and it breaks it down in the code. I can't show it to you, but it's one of the links in the slide. Like at the end, I have a, a few slides links as well so make sure you download it um, but if you go through each of the checkpoints you, you do your testing it should work also um, at our at our agency since we're a government agency we have a committee uh, an accessibility committee that's a great place to grab people to do user testing testing is always important using the tools always important and you can work through things to get your, your site accessible you, you have to go through the guidelines you have to meet the guidelines and it's a it's a number of different tests. We 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 improve and we fix all these areas, and then how do we know that it's going to pass ADA complaints? Well, like I said, there's a tool that'll test. It'll give you feedback. It'll say, hey, your images are fine, your links are fine, but you need to correct your form. You said between AA and AAA, there's some barriers. Like for instance, on certain things, yes. Yeah, yeah. With, with the agency I work for, we're a government agency, we were deemed for accessibility, and they said, hey, we want to make sure your writing information is semantic, 
and your PDFs are compliant. And they gave us a certain amount of time to do it. And so we made sure we went out, brought in an agency to help make our HTML compliant. And we had a, a series of things that we also got from our, um, um, our consultant to make sure that we went through these steps every time we did updates on our PDFs. So you'll get specifics on what you need to do. But again, like the gentleman said, there's various things that you have to do to meet it. Any other? Hey, Alex. Good talk, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Okay, how can we gain empathy for our accessible, our disabled users using websites? Again, it's, it's about testing. Again, like when I was off and I had to, and I, I did those trials myself, um, just think when you leave here today, the very next site you pull up on your, on your laptop, hit the tab key. You become more aware just by doing that. The next time you're designing something and you receive a color ballot, go over to the color contrast analyzer and check it. That's the only way we can gain empathy because eventually as we get older, like for me, I was temporarily disabled and that was a term by the state of California. I was unable to do my job for a certain amount of time. A lot of times we don't do things until we become that person. So I'm just saying, I hope after hearing this and there's a few small things that you can do to tweak your process, please do. Yes. You mind if I add to your answer for Alex? Oh, sure. Um, what I would suggest is try using a screen reader um, like Orca or, or another type of screen reader and um, see if the website can be traveled through a screen reader or a text-based web browser that can use like uh, text. And there's a screen reader built into your Apple so automatically. Yep. And doing. you can enable that and then so it will. So is there a built-in one for Windows? I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Okay, I don't know how we're doing on time, but Lara, did you have a? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, repeat, there was too much noise at the door. I think for Aria, I mean, again, you need to be succinct in what you're describing. I think we've seen some examples earlier where we tend to want to over explain something. I think just try to be as brief and succinct as possible in what you're using in your tags, because that's what's going to be read back. I would say user testing is probably the best way to figure out whether your, your Aria tags are succinct enough or not. I'm not sure if that helps. but. Oh, nice. Um, and then also Great. <laughs> All right, thank you. So inclusive, inclusive components. Inclusive components and accessibility, accessibility compliance cards. Yes, nutrition cards. All right, in the back. I think what you're describing was the web maybe 10 years ago. A while back, we would have a text only version of our site and a regular version. But now with uh, responsive websites, I mean, you can build a website that does everything you need. So why would you, that's sort of 
separating, oops, that's sort of marginalizing a different audience when you don't really have to. You have the tools to create something. I'm not sure if that sort of addresses it, but. Well, again, I, I think that's not good, a good practice. I mean, I think um, I'll give you this example. Imagine uh, my wife works at the school with dis disabled kids. She works with the special needs kids. Imagine taking your kid to school on the first day of school and she's not allowed to attend class. They want her to go to a different school. Our education system is about including kids with special needs in the normal flow of education because it's more beneficial. To me, it seems like more effort to make a second. You're sort of giving them something else that's not the same experience. In the Winn-Dixie example for, um, that I stated earlier, um, someone that was disabled couldn't do what someone that was cited could do on the same website. And there was no other way for them to do it. Um, I think you're getting into a tricky waters when, you, when, you, when you're separating and doing two different things for different audiences. Okay, any other questions? All right, well thanks for coming. Enjoy the rest of the week. Make sure you come tomorrow, both days, hashtag. <laughs>